According to these powerful people, Jesus came with a sword, not just words of peace. Check it out, leave your comments, ring the bell, share it with your friends, and subscribe to our channel. With you on the line with us is Jeff Charlotte. He is a professor at Dartmouth College. He's a journalist, author of six books, including The Family, The Secret Fundamentalism at the Heart of American Power, his latest, This Brilliant Darkness. He's also the executive producer of the uh, Netflix series, The Family, five-part miniseries. Uh, it, and, and you'll see my face in there if, uh, when you watch it. It's absolutely brilliant. And if you haven't seen it now, put, you know, write it down and put it on your list. It's called The Family. It's on Net Netflix. His, uh, his uh, uh, Twitter handle is Jeff Charlotte, S-H-A-R-L-E-T. Uh, Jeff, welcome back to the program, and thanks for being with us. I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak. I've been, I've been talking this morning about the historic role of... Um, how fascism interacts and functions with, with groups. We just had a, a long conversation, a good conversation with Professor Richard Wolff about how, uh, how, the econo how the big corporations and the economy uh, in Germany in the 1930s and Hitler kind of interpenetrated each other. Um, can you speak to the historic role of right-wing Christianity and the rise of fascism? Yeah, I think uh, there's, in fact, there's a lot of questions right now, people looking at Trump holding that Bible, a Bible, not his Bible, outside St. John's Church and saying, how can we stand the hypocrisy? And that's ignoring the fact that, in particularly in the United States, and particularly in, uh, but not exclusively, white evangelicalism, um, there has long been a power tradition and an idea uh, that was the thief in Christ, not, you know, not the lamb, not this loving figure, but a strong man, and is looking for a worldly counterpart. And Trump has found that and embraces Trump as a strong man. Um, and along with that comes uh, a sort of an ease with white nationalism, with corporate power, and so on. But at the heart of it is this idea of a, a of an all-encompassing power. Now, a lot of Americans who aren't familiar with your work or haven't been paying close attention to these kind of things would say, well, how can the white evangelicals uh, embrace Donald Trump? He's had three wives. He cheated on every single one of them uh, in various ways at various times uh, that have now come out. He, he has uh, declared bankruptcy six times. He's ripped off literally thousands of people based on over 3,000 lawsuits for his you know, failing to pay contractors and things. Um, he is... Uh, in so many ways, the definition of somebody who is the, uh, not just not a Christian, but the antithesis of the teachings of Jesus, particularly in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 25. Um, so, you know, it, it must just be that they're hooking up with him because he said he's going to protect their tax-exempt status or something. There's got to be some in, you know, self-interest here. Um, can you speak to what the real connection is in this whole King Cyrus meme that's floating through the right of the conservative Christian, Christian community? Yeah, well, that, but let, me, let me back up just a little bit before I get to King Cyrus. And you know, this idea of who Trump is, is because you said particularly in the Sermon on the Mount. Well, that's what you say, um, particularly in the Sermon on the Mount. We're also talking about the Christ. He said, I come not to bring peace, but the sword. There's more than one way to read Jesus. And they, again, this I really think is important, is what they read of Jesus is strength and power. Um, and so it's not as hypocritical for them as it seems, but it is. There is an element of transactional, and I think that's an element that, that those of us on the left and secular folks need to understand, too, is to say, how can they... How can they do this? Well, they're not dummies. They have ends that they want to achieve. And remember, it's not just about tax breaks. It's about uh, transformation of U.S. law at every level. And if you look at the Trump administration, as Ralph Reed, longtime Christian right political operative, a uh, key figure, says, because we have more of our, more Christians, that we should be right wing political fundamentalists, more Christians in government than we have ever had before. And that's actually true. I mean, more Christians, more fundamentalists. That's true. So they're getting, they're getting, you know, they're <laughs> getting a lot of bang for the buck. But they do then go take, take this theological term that you refer to, King Cyrus. King Cyrus in the Bible is not a, uh, uh, he's, he's a, he's a goy. Um, he's not one of the Israelites. Um, and yet he uh, plays this sort of instrumental role uh, for the Israelites. And in this sense, uh, they can look at, at Trump and have embraced Trump. And by the way, this comes from uh, 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 Isaiah 45, and Trump is president number 45. Coincidence, you know, I sort of I think not is that thinking, right? Is uh, that Trump is like Cyrus. Trump is a tool used by God. And in fact, his very ungodliness, the very, all the ways in which he deceives, you know, thrice Mary, like people like to say, and, and you know, everything. This is proof of God's goodness. If this guy can be elected, God must surely be doing it, right? God's hand must be in play here. Um, and, and, and look, they're, they're being proven right all the time. They're getting what they want. We're right down to that walk across uh, Lafayette Park to the St. John's Church, which was a performance of the merger of state power, of violent power, and a Christian power uh, that they've been looking for. You know, they put their faith in this tool, and, and it's been rewarding. Yeah. It's been a lot of years since I lived in Germany. I was the uh, 87, 88, but, uh, and, and read uh, uh, William Shearer's The Rise and Fall of the Thirty Right. Um, but my recollection is that Hitler 
uh, with his Reichsbishop and Muller, was his name, uh, Muller, um, that Hitler was actually fairly effective at manipulating Christian sentiment. Um, and, and I'm guessing, and I'm no student of this, and I'm not sure if you are either, um, but I'm guessing that Mussolini did as well in Italy, and I'm not sure, frankly, about Franco in Spain. Can, is this something that you've ever looked into, Jeff? Uh, Fran uh, Franco in Spain was uh, a right-wing Catholic dictatorship. That's what it was. Um, uh, and, yeah, these kinds of collaborations have always been there. I, I find them actually a little bit less useful, the German context, the Italian context, the Spanish context. Um, uh, you could also say Sahara in the Middle East context with the use of Islam. We could look at Erdogan in Turkey, sort of totally Trump right now. Uh, and his use of a, of a kind of uh, hyper-capitalist, far-right uh, version of Islam. Um, you need to look at the American context. Um, it, it, it does us no good to say that what Trump is doing with like Nazi Germany, because what Trump is doing is like Trump. This is the moment we can find right now. And if we, I, I worry that sometimes on the left we spend too much time trying to neatly line this up with bad events in the past, and it's blinding us to the particular nuances of the moment. Particular uh, aspect of the American right, one of which is really historic and often sort of under comment on, is the alliance of right wing white evangelicals uh, and right wing Catholics. Protestantism and Catholicism historically haven't gotten along very well. But you look at a guy like Bill Barr, uh, who's a right wing Catholic, uh, working with a guy like Mike Pompeo, who's a right wing evangelical, and you see a coalition and an alliance and a kind of a new theology being formed. That doesn't have a precedent in Germany, Italy, or Spain. Uh, that's happening right now. And if we're going to understand it and identify the fault lines within it, uh, we don't want to be, we want to be informed by history, uh, but uh, not trying to pour this into a mold. That's true, yeah. A good point, and, and, and I take the point. Um, at the same time, we're seeing, I, I believe that there's not a single Protestant on the Supreme Court right now, and all, and all or most of the Catholics are members of this uh, Opus Dei Church in D.C. Is this, is this something that we should be concerned about? Uh, well, Opus Dei is not a church. Uh, Opus Dei is a, it, it's, uh, an interesting sort of uh, entity within Catholicism. He founded in 1935, same year as the group I've written so much about the family responses to national prayer breakfast. Um, and both emerging uh, at this moment when they're looking around the world and they see fascism here, they see communism, Stalinism there, and they see what they perceive as the weak response of the democracy. They think democracy is not, is not enough. They're certainly not going to be communist, um, but they also don't want to be fascist. Um, and and, you know, what they don't want, what they don't like about fascism is the displacement of God as a central figure by a Fuhrer or Mussolini and so on. And so they develop what they see as a kind of third way. Um, that Catholic tradition develops a much more intellectual and, and draws from a much more intellectual tradition. And that, you know, I think that is part of why the judiciary, uh, the right-wing judiciary is dominated by right-wing Catholics. There's an intellectual tradition for them to draw on. I wouldn't make too much of their affiliation with Opus Dei. I'd make a hell of a lot more of the decisions that they are issuing from the bench. Uh, and, um, you know, in other words, I, I, it's, it's right out there in the open. We don't need to look uh, behind the scenes. Trump is putting it right out there for us to see. The only thing I was saying is that that was very interesting because I remember that night he talked about uh, the, the uh, European Masonic orders and how the Mexican gangs in Los Angeles and around the country use Masonic symbols from a particular Masonic order in Europe, while the black gangs use an opposing symbols in, in terms and in symbols of a different Masonic order in Europe. And, they, and that most likely the, the, the gang members themselves do not realize that these are actually can be traced back to Masonic symbols in Europe. And, and so I believe that the gang going on in America today are being organized, collected, and financed out of Europe to destroy our culture in America. I think that European Freemasonry is heavily involved in destroying America. And you need to understand the whole story about how America was founded and how it was, a, it was founded as a corporation. It's a privately owned corporation. We can you know, talk about that for days on the end. Um, and this is just my opinion, one man's opinion. But I'm going to give you my opinion as to the bottom line on the world today and the stuff that's going on on the earth today. Uh, what we call Illuminati was a, originally uh, a term which was given to us uh, in Spain to um, a religious order in Spain, but later on were amalgamated into what we call Jesuits. So the Jesuits are truly Illuminati themselves. Um, 
and the Vatican, and, and you go well, that was the Vatican, what I was going yeah. to say. Yeah. I believe that one of the most evil organizations that exist on the earth today, and you'd have to have spent all the years with me in libraries and research societies and traveling around the world and talking to other writers, authors, lecturers, and teachers, and collecting this stuff over a period of 45 to 48 years to understand what I'm telling you. But I believe today the most serious evil organization on the face of the earth is the Vatican. That's my personal opinion. I think if, if the Vatican was done away with on the face of the earth, there would be a shot of liberation heard around the world. <clears throat> because the Vatican, in my opinion, is the, is the bulwark of this dark thing that's happening on the earth. But when you talk about the Illuminati, when you talk about the really dark criminal stuff that's going on in the earth, you're talking to the Vatican. You're talking the Knights of Malta, which gave us the six men who founded the CIA in America, were all Catholic members of the Knights of Malta. When you begin to look at the banking fraternities in America, like the Bank of America, Union Bank in California, all of these people who founded these banks and today are running the banking establishment are all Knights of Malta, Catholic masonry. So when I hear people talking about the Jews this, the Jews that, and the Jews are this, I say, no, no, you better go back and do your homework. The Jews have been slaughtered all over, all over Europe by the Vatican. You need to remember that for at least 2,300 years, Rome has dominated Europe. Under the Caesars of Rome, and in the 4th century, late 4th century, the Vatican comes into, into being, and the Vatican dominates all of Europe. All the heads of state, all the princes and kings and rulers, all the kings and rulers in Europe rule by the divine right. It's called the divine right of kings. What are you talking about? Who represents the divine to give the king the right? The Pope. The Pope appoints certain families to be over the French. The Pope appoints certain people to be over the Germans and over the British. And so by divine right. Why? Because the Pope represents God. And the Pope says that this family is holy and that they should rule. And therefore, they could now say they were by divine right. And the whole idea of divine goes back to the chalice, you know, and the, the Holy Grail. And in the Catholic Mass, you have the, the priest breaking the bread and then pouring the wine. The wine is made from grapes, and wine is red. So it's a red grape wine represents the blood of, of the atonement blood. It's a blood sacrifice. But where does the blood, I mean, where does the wine come from? It comes from grapes. And grapes grow on divine. And that's where we get the concept and the word divine, because it comes from grapes come from divine. So that's where we get the word divine. And once you begin to realize how the Vatican has for over 2,300 years, Rome has dominated Europe, and in 1,600 years, the Vatican has dominated Europe. And Europe for 2,300 years has dominated the Earth. So if you want to talk about conspiracies, and you want to talk about evil, don't talk about Jews. You better talk about the people who have controlled Europe for over 2,300 years, Caesar of Rome, the Roman Catholic establishment. There's the real story. Now you're getting into mafiosi. Now you're getting into the fraternal orders of Freemasonry out of Europe, Knights of Malta. Now you're getting into the organized crime, Sicily, Corsica, Corsica, and all of the profound drug running, white slavery, murder for hire, Vatican. I mean, even, uh, what was his name, the producer of Godfather? Um, what was his name? Uh, Francis Ford Copeland. And Godfather III. Francis Ford Copeland and Godfather III, the third one in the series, opens up with Michael Corleone being anointed by the Cardinal in New York to be a member of the Knights of Malta in the Catholic Church in New York. What is he telling you? The connection between the Vatican, the Holy Father, there's nothing holy about the Holy Father. There's nothing holy in Israel. Nothing. There's nothing holy in the Vatican. There is nothing holy in Salt Lake City. There's nothing holy in religion, period. It's a way that the masters, whoever these entities are who are controlling the human race, they have set up certain institutions of learning, of education, religion, and government. That's why I've said, you better go back and do your homework on where the history of the world comes from. I don't see the world being run by Jews. I see Jews being used, but you will find that even Rothschild, the, the, uh, the, the Rothschild family that we hear so much about, those Jews who were running Europe. No, if you go back and look at the history of the Rothschilds, you will find that Rothschild represented the Vatican. 
He was dealing for the Vatican. He was a Vatican banker appointed by the Vatican to deal for them so that the Catholic Church would never be involved in all that terrible stuff going on in banking. Well, let the Jew do it. Then, of course, if, if something comes out, well, it's Jewish, obviously. No, no, it's your money that he was handling. So if you really want to nail down the real enemy to America and then to the earth, I'm telling you, it's only taken me 48 years to get here. I was born and raised Catholic. I mean, I, I, my whole family was very Catholic in town. We were the most Catholic family in town. But I know history. And I know that the most criminal organization on the face of the earth, in my humble opinion, I don't know that much about it, I've just, I've just been looking at it for 48 years, is the Vatican. As far as I'm concerned, it's the worst thing that's ever happened to the world is what's really going on in the Vatican. And that doesn't even bring up the subject of propaganda doing. 